Hi, everybody, and welcome back into the conversation where we continue to destigmatize conversations around cannabis through the world of sports. Set the record straight about this powerful plant, and we hope have a little fun along the way. I'm your host, Dave Griggs, former CNN, NBC Sports, Fox News anchor, and host at Turner Sports. My wingman on this journey, New York Giants all time leading receiver, Amani Toomer. Very thrilled to have offered four Hall of Fame guests on this program tonight. We welcome in our third author. He is Josiah Hesse. The book is Runners High How a Movement of Cannabis Fueled Athletes is Changing the Science of Sports. Thanks so much for having me. Great to have you on, man. So, this really, Amani said to me when he read the book and saw you talk, this busts the stigma. It shatters the, the image that we have of the pot smoker who's lazy, sitting on the couch, eating Cheetos. Um, is that, was that your goal here to just shatter the, the image people have of a cannabis, of a pot smoker? I think that was one of them. Uh, there are a variety of uh, uh, avenues of this topic that tickled my curiosity. But when I learned that such a large volume of professional athletes, uh, at least according to my reporting, the majority of professional athletes are using cannabis in some capacity, uh, either before, during, or after their workouts or competition. Yeah, that, that kind of blew my mind. I didn't have a background in uh, sports journalism uh, at all. I'd been a journalist for uh, about a decade at this point, but uh, had never really been uh, th that intrigued by uh, sports journalism. Uh, so I kind of had this uh, um, misconception about the sports world, similar to the misconceptions people have about cannabis users, uh, that it was very conservative, that it wouldn't be very welcoming to uh, people with uh, a more artistic uh, mindset. And then to find out that cannabis was so popular in that uh, world, um, uh, a lot of it being for pain relief as, as a uh, healthier alternative to uh, opioid medications. But also uh, when I heard people describing the, the psychological shifts that they would go through uh, with cannabis in corporation with physical activity was something that just jived so well with what I'd been experiencing for a long time as a runner myself, someone who was never interested in exercise uh, up until almost the age of 30. Uh, and when I started taking edibles, uh, running became uh, not only very helpful uh, from a physical and mental health standpoint, but really the, the most fun part of my day. Uh, so learning that this was not just isolated to me, that this was actually very popular and very underreported. Uh, I didn't have to really fight any other journalists to get uh, this beat of a topic. Um, you know, it, it just seemed like a no brainer for a project to jump into. It's really strange because I, I was an athlete for 13 years in the NFL and never even considered using cannabis because I was, I had bought into the, the, what the government and what the society had told us about cannabis. And, you know, I, I had a similar journey to you. I got into cannabis late, but, um, why is, is, is the purpose of your book to try and just, just let people know what's happening or you want to enlighten people to let that, hey, cannabis is not what, you, what people ordinarily perceive it as? I think in both cases, uh, the answer is yes. Um, I think there, there's uh, so many misconceptions that people have about this plant, the people, the type of people who use it, the effect that they get out of it that it, it was, um, there was an urgency for me as a cannabis user and someone who had been around a culture that had been demonized uh, by this. I come from a, a working class uh, a culture in the Midwest uh, where people you know, had been dismissed, their, their character had been dismissed uh, because of the fact that they use cannabis. Um, but then you know, the, there's the activism side of it, but then also as a journalist, there, there's just so much curiosity that fuels uh, the work that I do. Um, I, when I find something really fascinating, I wanna just take in as much of that information as I can. And when it came to the idea that 
Uh, we have um, a natural uh, evolutionary derived reward system that gives us pleasure for certain behaviors, you know, for eating food, for having sex, for having sleep. We get this release of uh, dopamine and other reward chemicals that make us feel good. And realizing that we had the same mechanisms for exercise and that it was a natural form of cannabis uh, that gave us what we call the runner's high, this like uptick in mood, this reduction in pain that comes with around 30 minutes of cardio at around 70% heart rate. Uh, that's kind of like just the average window that gives people the release of this natural cannabinoid in the brain called anandamide, which uh, comes from the Sanskrit word for bliss, uh, and that it acts on the brain just like THC does. It's very similar to a THC high and the euphoria that it gives and the reduction in pain that it gives and that you don't need cannabis to experience this, but for those who are having a difficult time experiencing it, like it seems like a lot of America is having a difficult time experiencing pleasure from exercise uh, based on how often uh, they do it. Um, cannabis can be a sort of key for unlocking that door of pleasure in exercise, uh, as well as having all these health benefits uh, and being a healthier alternative for, for pain management. And then also just that it acts differently in its pain management uh, 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 properties than say an ibuprofen or an opiate would in that it doesn't eliminate the physical pain. It, it changes your emotional relationship to the pain. You know, so we process pain in very different regions of the brain. There's the part that just notices, oh, my ankle is uh, yelling at me right now. There's something going on there. And then there's the emotional side of like, oh my God, this hurts so much. I want to scream right now. Uh, it's driving me crazy, the pain that's coming from this ankle. Cannabis can change your relationship to that pain and that you notice that it's there, but it's not freaking you out in the way that uh, it typically would in the past. And no pain management tool does this uh, that we have to us. So yes, I had the activism side of me that wanted to dispel these uh, very old uh, stereotypes we have about cannabis users, but also the science uh, and the, the social science of it was something that just uh, was too fascinating to ignore. Now, to your point, Josiah, a lot of people do not enjoy the act of exercising. And you acknowledge you did not work out. You did not enjoy it. Tell me about that first moment where you used an edible, you went on a run. What did that feel like? And, and what's the dosage? Are we talking 5, 10, 15 milligrams? Uh, well, the, just to touch on dosage, uh, that's different for everyone. Uh, okay. For me, the window is around 10 to 20 milligrams of THC uh, taken maybe at, um, uh, 20 minutes before a run. Uh, you know, and if I'm doing a long run, um, like I did a 50K uh, last April, so that was like eight hours of running. And in that case, you know, I took several edibles, you know, maybe 90 milligrams over the course of that whole day. I knew a guy uh, who took 150 milligrams and then swam from San Francisco to Alcatraz. What? Oh! <laughs> uh, I, I know people that'll take 600 milligrams uh, of THC. Uh, everyone's uh, system is different and it's not quite the same in relationship to dosage as say like uh, alcohol or opioids and that there's not really a toxicity level uh, where it's gonna you know kill you. Um, but getting back to your original question about, for me and my experience, uh, and this story that I'll tell is one that I heard again and again and again from other people, not professional athletes who'd been working out for their whole lives, but from people who never enjoyed exercise before and suddenly they did. Um, they often get onto it for the same reason that I did, mental health reasons, uh, heard it helps with anxiety and depression and insomnia got it, uh, attempted running a handful of times, really didn't enjoy it. Uh, it hurt, I was exhausted, it, 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 you know, it was just misery all the way through. And uh, when I tried it with an edible, uh, inspired by that uh, old Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary, Pumping Iron, seeing them smoke a, a joint at the end of that, uh, I, when I tried it with an edible, uh, I suddenly felt like I lost 50 pounds, like just running up a hill. I said, I felt lighter 
you know, I, I had a run the other day where I, my body wasn't feeling too good. And I felt like I weighed 300 pounds, you know, like I'm running through water and it was just like, oh, you know, uh, I've been training too hard. That's a whole nother story. But in this case, it's like the exact opposite. Like I felt like just a fucking butterfly, you know, floating up that trail. Uh, and I, the mind body connection, you know, really zoning in on the placement of my foot on the ground, uh, the rhythm of my breathing, all of it just sort of came into this uh, myopic focus where nothing really mattered, nothing else in the world. It was just my feet, my lungs, you know, one step after another, the music that I was listening to suddenly, uh, suddenly sounded uh, infinitely better. And I found myself not running to get somewhere, you know, like a discipline that I'm pushing through the discomfort to get to the reward at a later time. The reward was coming in real time in the present moment. And that was the only reason that I was running. You know, it was just a, a kind of playful, childlike experience uh, that uh, was so infectious. I just, I found myself wanting to do it every day. And a lot of the researchers that I spoke with for this book talk about, you know, why do people not exercise? Well, most of them are being told they have to by their doctor, by their spouse, someone, your health is in trouble. You have to do this. You're going to die. You're, you know, going to get diabetes or heart disease. And so they're like, okay, fine, I'll just do it. And they hate it. Uh, and it's not like something that they're motivated to do internally. Like that's really, uh, what marks the difference between someone who's gonna stick with it or do it more vigorously versus somebody who's doing it because of an authority figure that's forcing them to do it. I think that's one of many things that cannabis gave me and a lot of other people was uh, doing away with any sort of authority dynamic in the reason that you're doing this, you know, and doing away with the self-consciousness of it. Like, do I, do I look ugly while I'm doing this? Do I look stupid? Do I look like I not know what I'm doing? I don't belong in this gym. Look at everyone else. They obviously belong here. They're the real athletes. You know, I'm just a poser that's, you know, looks ridiculous out here. That's what like trips up a lot of people and me, myself included in the past when I would, you know, attempt to go to a gym or exercise. And what I hear again and again from people uh, is the same thing I experience where everything else is just gone. And all you've got is that, you know, either like curl of the bicep or swing of the tennis racket or, you know, the, the hills uh, that you're skiing down. That's all that your mind and body are locked into. Uh, and it's, it's a, a whole lot of fun, at least in my experience. Now, Josiah, I took an edible at MJ BizCon and I went, I, I, only th I took 10 milligrams and the only thing I wanted to do was go to sleep. How do I find the right strain, the right, so that I can experience the, the, uh, the, the uplift or the uh, get close to the runner's high? Because I love exercising. Uh, but to me, putting those two together, exercising and cannabis, I always usually just go to sleep. Is there, am I, am I doing something wrong? Uh, it could be the dosage. Um, you know, I was just talking with a friend of mine who was a, an activist that pretty much was integral to get uh, Colorado legalized years ago. And he was telling me, um, you know, the, this recommended dosage of 10 milligrams is just too high. You know, we had to fight to get the Colorado uh, um, uh, board that oversees cannabis to to bring it down to 10 milligrams because it used to be just like wild west nobody knew what they were taking and most of the time when people take too much they're experiencing uh, the biphasic effect of cannabis which means like on the it's like a bell curve like on the one hand over here you've got energy focus uh balance euphoria and then you take too much and suddenly you're coming down on the other end which is lethargy paranoia anxiety a lack of coordination uh, and you mentioned like 10 milligrams, you know, making you sleepy. Uh, that's not uncommon with a lot of people. And, and that can be great if what you want to do is go to sleep. Uh, but I, I recommend uh, try cutting that in half, you know, and, and also uh, this is my experience and it's what I've heard from a lot of other people. It helps to already be active when it kicks in, mm. uh, you know, so like 
if you take it right before your uh, workout, it's going to take 20, 30 minutes or so, depending on the edible, maybe longer uh, to kick in. And a lot of the time, if you're already like sedentary, you know, I mean, you've probably experienced this as an athlete in general with working out that when you're already like in some kind of motion throughout your day, it's a lot easier to just kind of glide into your workout rather than if you've been sitting on the couch for two hours, you know, eating shitty food and, and watching TV. Now there's anything wrong with that. And then suddenly get up and it's time to work out. Your body is like, I don't know. Uh, like it, there's a little bit of resistance there. So already having your heart rate up, already being moving, um, it, that's uh, something that helps a lot. And, and also there are more and more products out there. This wasn't the case when I started writing the book, but there are more and more products out there for athletes uh, that have a variety of different cannabinoids, but then also uh, different supplements uh, in those products that work as a kind of like pre-workout uh, that, you know, most athletes uh, take some form of pre-workout if it's, you know, caffeine or, you know, beets or, or whatever. Like this is something, it's, it's interesting how the cannabis industry is sort of melding into a lot of these sports performance products. And we're yeah. finding ways that, that cannabis can uh, aid uh, uh, the, the substances that are already out there, that they can have a harmonious effect. Uh, cannabis, of course, remains on WADA's banned list. Amani, along with Tiki Barber and several other athletes, signed a petition to get it removed. Um, obviously, the three qualifiers are that it's, it is performance enhancing, that it is harmful to the athletes, and the third is kind of a catch-all bullshit that it is harmful to the spirit, violates the spirit of sport. The runner's high you described there, Josiah, sounds like it is performance enhancing. Is it? I think, uh, you know, the short answer is yes. Uh, the long answer is not in the way that we traditionally understand that term. Uh, Cause you just mentioned how, how WADA defines that term. And uh, they, they've applied all three of those at, at various times and different yep. organizations have to uh, the substance that it's uh, both performance enhancing and that it has a, a deterious effect on on performance you know that it's it's bad for your health and that it uh, improves your health you know that there's these conflicting ideas around it and then and there's the violates the spirit of the sport which wada elaborated on in this 2011 paper with the national institute on drug abuse where they talk about athletes as role models for children and that using cannabis would uh, uh make it problematic uh that they're uh, uh, role models for children, which uh, really just kind of illustrates how much uh, they're living in Nancy Reagan's America. That it's uh, we're, we can just say no. <laughs> <laughs> we're sorry. No, it's all right. Uh, <laughs> living in Colorado, and I know this is the case in on the West Coast as well. You live in a bit of a bowl, uh, bubble, and you forget that there are parts of the world that. You know we're still very much in the in the war on drugs, uh, and and that includes Europe as well, where a lot of these sports are you know uh, at least as big as they are in the states, and 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 the drug laws are even more antiquated than they are uh, in in the states, uh, you know, with a, a few exceptions. Um, so I think mostly, uh, you know, cannabis can be a performance enhancer but not in the way that we think about say steroids, which would take you beyond your natural genetic limits. Like if you have two people with the exact same genes right. doing the exact same workout, you know, but one of them saying steroids, the other one's not, the one who's taking them is gonna, you know, have way bigger gains uh, than the person who isn't. That's not gonna be the case with uh, cannabis. Uh, you know, I talked to one uh, sports medicine educator that compared it to putting ice on an injury. He said, if I ice someone's ankle that's injured, I'm not taking that ankle beyond its natural limits. I'm not giving you a stronger, faster, better ankle, you know, and it's, it's the same thing with the heart, you know, or the lungs or anything. It's going to return you to a state of balance after you've been so depleted in your training or your performance uh, that you need something to help you get to sleep, uh, to help uh, reduce muscle spasticity, 
uh, that's going to help you recover faster or something that's going to make you uh, that's going to change your psychological approach to training that's going to make you enjoy it more and maybe go a little bit harder and push through a lot of those mental barriers that all athletes encounter you know you talk to I, I spoke with a lot of endurance athletes that say oh, this game is 90 percent mental and 10 percent physical uh, and I'm sure that's the case you know outside of endurance sports as well and so the, a lot of those games that you have to navigate in your own head during your training or your performance can be mitigated by cannabis. But that's also the case with uh, antidepressants, you know, or benzodiazepines sure. uh, or sleep aids, none of which are, are banned in, uh, by WADA. So I think it really is those cultural attitudes that WADA has towards cannabis that, that keeps it banned and keeps these really harsh punishments. Uh, coming to athletes. But a lot of that has changed uh, and seems to uh, continue to change in the years ahead. So this may all uh, be something we talk about in a historical context very soon. Yeah, Josiah, uh, Dave and I were both very disappointed with Shakira Richardson when she got, um, you know, she got suspended from the Olympics. I mean, she wasn't able to compete in, the, in this, this summer's Olympics. Uh, oh, what are your thoughts on that? And, and uh, what do you think, how can cannabis play a role in sports in the future uh, responsibly? That's a, a great question. I mean, I think for Shikari Richardson, it's just a flat out tragedy, uh, both for her and for her fans, for the sports fan world in general, because she was such a, a, a rising star even before this controversy. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just ridiculous that somebody who works so hard and achieves so much can have it all taken away from her for something uh, so trivial. Um, but in, in terms of what role cannabis can have in sports, it's, it, there, there's so many different things to consider in there. I mean, you can compare it with alcohol, which has a huge presence uh, in, in US sports. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a half mile away from the Coors Stadium as I re uh, record this, you know, and, we, and we've got uh, uh, teams or games that are sponsored by uh, alcohol companies. And uh, in the running world, you know, they, they have races that start and end at breweries here in Colorado. And everyone's encouraged, like, at the end of your run to have a beer. And I love beer, too. It's just like if you had anything remotely close to that with cannabis in professional sports, even a T-shirt or an advertisement somewhere, you know, there, there are mothers in this country that will lose their minds. I mean, I don't mean to gender it like it's just women, uh, but like it's uh, uh, people would, you know, like WADA, a lot of people at WADA presumably would think that this is a bad influence on children. Uh, and yet we could have so much uh, a positive application of cannabis with athletes, uh, you know, in, in, in that capacity of them as role models. I would think that talking about uh, cannabis in relation to alcohol or opioids would be, uh, um, you know, fulfilling that role as, as a role model for children, because I think this is something that children should be educated on. I mean, I, I'm not taking a stance on uh, encouraging children to use it. I think in medical capacities, there, there, there are circumstances where it should be applied, but I think that being honest uh, about who is using it, who's already using it in sports uh, is, is great for children uh, as, as a role model. Um, and I think in the future, as federal legalization uh, inevitably disappears, uh, and as this industry uh, increases on the, the very lucrative path that it's already on, it's only a matter of years before that money just shoves its way into pro sports. Uh, and you've seen so many um, sports leagues have these dramatic changes in uh, their uh, testing around cannabis uh, and, and segregating cannabis from other drugs, uh, having lighter and lighter penalties uh, or none at all uh, for cannabis testing. So I imagine in five, 10 years, uh, it's at least going to be okay for an athlete to admit they use cannabis, probably okay for them to be endorsed by at, at least CBD companies uh, we're seeing now, but more and more, I think you'll see full uh, THC products being endorsed by 
uh, non-retired pro athletes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of the time the retired athletes who are, uh, you know, <laughs> for obvious reasons, there's such uh, harsh consequences. Uh, you know, if you're, it, it's your career that's at stake. But I think uh, hopefully in years to come, uh, professional athletes careers won't be at stake for admitting they use cannabis or even participating in this industry. You know, we've spoken to a lot of those former players and Amani is one. Uh, Calvin Johnson, Megatron said that he thinks 75% of the NFL probably smokes. Paul Pierce said that number is probably like 80 to 90 in the NBA where there is a cannabis culture. Why won't a current athlete stand up and what would it mean? You, you say in your research, you found that guys in the NFL and golf and the NBA are using it. So they're obviously big name, massively popular athletes that are using cannabis. What would it mean if one of them were to come forward and really try to change the stigma? Will we see that? Well, I think we saw that issue being forced on Shikari Richardson this summer. Uh, and I think- Yeah, but uh, I mean football, I mean baseball. This country yeah. only cares about track and field once every four years. I uh, mean, Patrick Mahomes, I mean, somebody like that. Yeah, I mean, I think it would take uh, examples. You know, it's like a lawyer looking for a precedent, uh, a lawyer giving advice to a client. They, they look at precedents. They said, well, so-and-so was in your position five years ago and they did this and they got this fine or this jail sentence or they got off for it. And I think it would be a similar thing for an athlete. You know, if you had one or two that stood up and said, yes, I use cannabis, I do regularly. And I think we're, we have seen that, uh, you know, maybe not with players with the, that same clout, but I think we have seen that more and more lately, but I think, uh, they, they still have consequences, uh, and it's someone we haven't seen people, at least to my knowledge, and uh, I'm, like I said before, I'm not a sports reporter, but I don't think we've seen uh, a lot of people lose millions of dollars, you know, standing up and saying, I, I use cannabis. And yeah. uh, it, I think if we saw someone in a high stakes situation, you know, go one way or the other, they, they admit they use cannabis and nothing happens or a lot of good things happen or something terrible happens, that's when we'll start to see other players be like, oh, I can do that too. Or I better not do that because look what happened to that person. Uh, yeah. And I think it's, yeah, everyone's sort of standing around. Like you said, we all know what what's going on, but uh, I think a lot of the fans don't, the people watching you know, on Sunday afternoons. Uh, and those are in those parts of the country that don't have the same sensibilities around cannabis uh, that we do in Colorado or California, or now it's changing in New York. Uh, I think we just uh, have some, the parts of the country have some catching up to do on this issue. Uh, but it, I, I imagine it can't be much longer uh, before we see this shift uh, happening. Um, but we've seen it on smaller levels. Uh, I know it's not as big as uh, football, but with uh, um, uh, ultra marathon running, uh, I, I talked about the first athlete, professional athlete to be endorsed by a cannabis company. And this was somebody who was doing, Avery Collins, who was doing very well uh, in his career and was getting attention from some very big sponsors that uh, suddenly would drop him when their international teams found out that he uses cannabis, is public about his cannabis use. So it was costing him a lot. And there were other runners that would lose to him that would demand that he be drug tested and, and make it a big public thing uh, that, you know, this guy, Avery Collins, is using performance enhancing drugs to win these races and he should be, you know, uh, uh, drug tested. And he offers to be drug tested at the beginning of every race. He's like, I stopped using two weeks beforehand because there's so much attention on him because yeah. he's public about this and because he's accepted money from the cannabis industry. He's like, I'll, I'll go ahead and be drug tested. But the other people who are using during the races, and a lot of them are, don't have to face any sort of drug test uh, because they're private about it. Okay. And, that, and that's what I wanted to ask you about because I was not familiar that running on cannabis was even a thing. Um, how common is it? 
it, those same numbers that I was hearing for the uh, NBA and NFL, uh, around 80 to 90 percent uh, from the people that I spoke with uh, said that if you're hanging out with a bunch of other uh, trail runners, you know, we're going to be getting high at some point in the day. Uh, Avery Collins was said it it would be akin to going to a party and uh, wondering if there'd be alcohol consumed there. Wow. Like, it's just, uh, I talked to uh, the, an editor from the blog I Run Far, which is uh, one of the leading um, uh, uh, trail running uh, uh, publications. And she said that she finds uh, the, these uh, pen vaporizer cartridges on the trails. And she said like, it's kind of an open secret that People are using these on the trails or using edibles uh, when they're on the trails. Uh, and, and it's controversial and they do have to be secretive about it. Uh, but yeah, I would say that it's probably most popular of all the sports that I looked into, probably most popular in ultra marathon running. I think because it kind of has this uh, counterculture uh, roots to it, sort of yeah. starting in Colorado in the 70s when a lot of these uh, like former uh, hippies from the city were like starting communes in Boulder or in Trinidad. And a lot of the uh, uh, Frank Shorter who won the golden uh, the Olympic uh, marathon race in 72, he moves to Boulder. A lot of people do. And suddenly that becomes like this Mecca of uh, ultra marathon runners. Um, but at the same time, the counterculture movement of uh, Allen Ginsberg and the Beatles were, were uh, blowing up in, in that area at that time. So it's, it is very much a kind of counterculture uh, scene in uh, ultra marathon running. Uh, I just, I remember Ricky Williams was an athlete who we just interviewed recently. He has a, a new brand called Highsmith, uh, Heisman. And he said his first year using cannabis he actually won the Heisman Trophy so I was blown away by that and then because you know I was in the league for a long time I never experienced any anything about cannabis and then I saw Michael Phelps you know he got you know he got he was a famous athlete who you know he had to do the whole apology you know a tour where he was apologizing to everybody because he got caught uh, hitting a bong after the Olympics and I, you know putting those two together is really still really difficult for me uh, as an athlete who got into cannabis late, uh, but to see that it's so prevalent and people just don't, you know, I think, you know, they just don't admit it um, and don't want to come out with it. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of hard for me to, for me to understand, but in another sense, you know, there most of these athletes are all about endorsement deals and, you know, trying to be popular and all that stuff. And I think, you know, we're just not there yet. And just like you said, in most parts of the country, um, I just, I just tried, how did you, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, going back to my old dosing question, I'm just trying to figure out. You sure like, you're not high right now? I'm not. I'm just trying to figure it out because, <laughs> because I'm, I'm not, like, I'm not sure. I, I was the one that smoked, man. No, 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 no. I just, I'm just like, I, I took the gummy and I'll go to sleep. I need to figure out how to, I want to catch that runner's high. You know, okay. and I do a lot I, of cycling now and I don't want to be on a bike, you know, I think you bring balance. up a good point, Josiah. And, and by the way, let's remind people the name of the book. It is Runners High, How a Movement of Cannabis-Fueled Athletes is Changing the Science of Sports. And we'll close with that. Um, Josiah, give us a kind of a manual, because I, I too want to experience what you described. So for people that are curious about this, that want to go for a jog, that want to use, or maybe want to enjoy their workout a little more, give us some advice. How should we go about it? Uh, well, the first thing, like I mentioned earlier, is start with a small dose and work your way up. Uh, you can always take more. You can't take less once you've taken it. Uh, take it at home when you don't have any responsibilities. Don't jump into an exercise routine if you haven't taken <laughs> cannabis before or haven't taken it in a long time. Uh, if you haven't exercised in a long time, uh, don't start high. You know, do that a couple of times and get used to it. I always tell people, don't try new things high. Uh, things that are require something from you. I'd never played soccer before and was into running high for years. And then someone invited me to play soccer with like real soccer players who are really <laughs> at this game. And here comes this like stoned hippie who doesn't even know which way to kick the ball. 
uh, you know, and they're yelling all these esoteric terms at me. I'm like, I don't know any of this. So like, don't try new things high, you know, uh, like trail running. I, I got so excited running on the trails that I just ran, ran, ran for like 10 miles the first time I did it. And then was like, I haven't been paying attention to any of those signs. I don't know where I am. <laughs> I didn't bring any water. I didn't bring any food. And it was hours before anyone found me. So like, you're going to try for the first time, maybe go to a park that you're familiar with uh, or a trail you're familiar with. Uh, you mentioned cycling. One of my favorite things is to take a lot of edibles and wear headphones, which I never do when I ride my bike in the city, but there are these trails that go all over the city and outside the city and there's no cars intersecting traffic. So it's all just like paved, you know, uh, basically highway. And so I can get locked into my music. Nothing's going to jump out at me there. So it's safe, but I do that all the time. So I'm not at any risk of falling over or getting lost. Uh, and like I said earlier, uh, be a little active before it kicks in. Um, try, if you're in a legalized state, talk to the butt tender about finding something that's good for exercise. Uh, I'd say about like half the butt tenders out there know what they're talking about. <laughs> you, you get one that knows something about something and you tell them like, hey, I'm going to use this before a hike or, you know, before my taekwondo class or whatever it is uh hopefully you've been doing taekwondo for a while and this is new uh you know then you can be like, oh, you know <laughs> it's just, uh, something from off field or you know wanna has uh, i think a new wanna fit uh they call it gummies uh, i haven't tried them yet but i'll be curious about that um and you know do go slow uh with the exercise as well most people, when they first start exercising, when they first hit that treadmill or go for the weights, they go as hard as they possibly can. Uh, they hurt themselves. They end up having a bad time. Uh, you know, don't just start sprinting on that treadmill. Like if you, if you haven't exercised at all, walking is the best. Go for a long walk around your city or your parks, whatever. If you want to have a little bit of cannabis with that, you know, put some headphones on, it could be a beautiful experience and work your way up, you know, maybe you start power walking or maybe you start doing some real light jogging. There's loads of videos on YouTube for aerobics, for yoga, you know, for people that are new to exercise. Uh, I think gyms are kind of a weird place. Some people love gyms, some people that's their home. I, I get weirded out by them. I'd rather put on a uh, you know, some Norwegian death metal at home and just work and do my own workout. Uh, but if, you, if you're into the gyms, you know, uh, uh, have at it. But I hear people say a lot like, oh, I get a little anxious from the cannabis and then I'm really anxious because I'm at the gym and everyone's looking at me and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, just go to the park. <laughs> Take a, a brisk walk. You know, if you want to do a couple push-ups, that's great but don't go crazy with the cannabis or the exercise. Ease your way into both of them. And remember, don't do new things high. That is great advice from Josiah Those are words to live by. Uh, <laughs> Those are words to live by. Both eagerly await uh, achieving a runner's high. Please check out the book. It is a terrific read. Josiah, it's been a great pleasure talking to you, man. Appreciate it. And that is terrific advice right there. See you in Denver. Thanks for having me. This has been great.